Okay, Fred, do you, do you want to start? Sure, I could start now, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll just do a quick intro if that's good with you. Okay, that's good. Okay, right now we have uh, 50 participants for today's and pr perhaps more with people, um, people who are sitting as couples uh, behind their screens. Welcome to, welcome to the Waterfall Identification Tips and Techniques uh, Workshop. Uh, Fred has uh, been a friend for many, many years, but he's a teacher in Hamilton and a retired up to this area of uh, Bruce County and what better place uh, to, the, what, what better place to retire than here. And uh, Fred has a passion for many, many, many things. Maryland is one, of course, but he also has a passion for uh, waterfowl, uh, for birds of all types. Fred, in fact, has been our leader, de facto leader for many years of the Bruce Birding Club, one of the founding members. And, uh, and each week we've been going out as a group, except during this COVID time, of course. And uh, or at least, at least uh, monthly we'd be going out uh, checking different, different areas for birds and bird watching. Fred's a, a member of the here in France Planning Committee, and uh, although it's been on hold this past year and next year, uh, we hope that, that that group was really hopeful that it'll be uh, current 2022 again at McGregor Point Park. Fred's had many, many, many outings for the festival, as well as uh, for uh, many other people in the area. Many, if you have any questions today, we ask that you post them uh, just in the Q&A area and we'll answer the questions at the end. We're not going to be taking questions during the presentation. But Fred, uh, welcome and thank you for doing this today and we're excited about it. So Fred, go, you're, you're on. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Stu, for, for that introduction. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody. Uh, Originally, this thing, uh, this presentation was given about five years ago at the Huron Fringe Birding Festival Committee, and I've, uh, I've tried to shorten it, and I've tried to change it so that the Zoom would work, and I've sort of changed the theme of it as well. Uh, while I'm getting started, I just want to welcome the groups that are participating in this today. There's the Bruce Birding Club, of course, uh, the Friends of McGregor, the Owen Soundfield Naturalist, the Saugeen Naturalist, and uh, the Huron Fringe Field Naturalist, and I just I just like to uh, to welcome all of you. Uh, you might want to know who is this uh, who is this uh, aimed at uh, this presentation aimed at? Well, as field naturalist, I guess some of you are probably interested in birding, but uh, you might be interested in other things like botany and things like that. Uh, and also uh, after that, we're all less ex you know we, the birders would probably fall into the categories of less experience and and experienced birders or more experienced birders. And uh, in, in, term, in terms of that, uh, I've tried to give something for everybody. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you're a less experienced birder, I think if you hang in here till the end, maybe take some notes, I think you'll find yourself in a really good position to be quite knowledgeable of waterfall identifications. Uh, you may not know anything, you may not be able to tell the difference between a warbler and a, and a vireo, but in terms of waterfowl, if you go in with a little bit of practice and, uh, and using some of these tips I gave you, I think you can be really well ahead of the game, at least in this, this one department. And uh, this is a good time of year to start because the waterfowl migration has just started. And uh, in addition to just starting, it's uh, going to probably peak in November and it'll probably end when there's a few stragglers get frozen out of the, the ponds and lakes uh, that, they're, that they're on. Uh, what's really good about waterfowl is that if you're half blind, half deaf, you're in the right department here because you've got a bird here that's big, as big as a football, probably minimum size and larger, larger than that, that tends not to hide. And as far as birding by ear, it's almost minimal in this, uh, in this area. So this is a really good, really good place to see yourself as, uh, as a less experienced bird. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is, well, no, no, I think I'll just move on and we'll start on here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to uh, look at this, uh, uh, look at this not from a, a field guide point of view. I'm going to try to look at it as what, how a, a birder would look at waterfowl and what's going through his mind. Now, as far as, you know, what's going through a person's mind is kind of the scenario for many uh, science fiction things. Uh, in this case, uh, 
the uh, what's going through this person's mind will be only on uh, on waterfowl and all the juicy parts will be uh, no, no juicy parts in the mind will be left by by a waterfowl bird or, or given out anyways um, what uh, so what I'd like to what I'd like to get into is uh, what I'm talking about here is uh, as a as a beginning burger or a starting burger, what happens to you is that you uh, uh, what happens to you is, is that you uh, look at the fuel guide and you look at fuel marks as being the be all and end all. And with experience, uh, pretty soon you find other quicker routes to identifying the bird than relying on the fuel marks. And what I'm trying to do today is I'm trying to go try to tell you what a, maybe an experienced birder's instincts are. So what you'll be doing, uh, uh, so, uh, so what you'll be doing is uh, you'll be, be talking about something that to refer to as the juice of a bird or your birding impression. So you're looking at a bird and you come to some conclusions as to whether, uh, uh, whether you're involved or whether you're, you're you know, uh, you know, what the bird's identification is without even going to a field guide. And of course, a field guide is there to uh, uh, kind of thing as a, as a last, last resort. Um, anyway, we're starting off with, here's a concept that uh, experienced birders know what I'm talking about. But if you're new to, new to waterfowl, uh, you can usually break up these birds into two categories. One is, uh, one is dabbling ducks. Uh, one is dabbling ducks, the other is diving ducks. And so if you can break up these birds into these two categories as being a diver or a dabbler, uh, what happens then is you can uh, focus on two distinct separate groups and you can categorize them. And so you start sorting, is it a diver, is it a dabbler? And that'll give you a list of birds. For example, if, you're, if it's a dabbler, uh, well, with low level reasoning, you'd understand that if you wanna be a dabbler and feed off the bottom, you're, uh, you're going to be, uh, uh, you're, you're, the water's going to be shallow. And if you're a diver, you're going to, you're going to want to go in deeper water. And, and, and also the food sources may be different. Uh, for the dabbler, it might be something like uh, insects, plants, uh, the odd tadpole that, hap tadpole that happens to swim by. But mostly it's a vegetarian kind of diet. For the diver, he's after other things. He's after fish, crustaceans, mollusks. And of course, he has a little bit of salad with that. As, has a little bit of salad with that as well. Anyways, uh, uh, moving on to uh, dabbling ducks. Here's an example of uh, of dabbling ducks in action. Uh, here's an example of dabbling ducks in action. We've got uh, uh, their their bums are tipped up and they're feeding off the bottom. And here's a very easy fill mark and a very dominant fill mark. You see that round hoop? I'm going to talk about this a little more, this round hoop or this kind of a bumper on the back end of this bird. Uh, well, this is a mallard. So these are, these are mallards that are eating off the bottom. So there's the first thing in your categorizing of divers and, and, and uh, dab, dabblers. You're into uh, mallards fit in the dabbling action. They're not going to dive. And where that comes into play is... Where that comes into play is, uh, where that comes into play is, you know, when you're looking at a bird and you're looking at out there and it's diving, you know, it's, you've eliminated a group of birds. For example, because you sort into the diving and dabbling, you know that the dabbler is going to be birds like mallard, black duck, uh, American widgeon, gadwall, and the two teals, blue wing teal, and, and everybody else is a diver. So as soon as you got that, you've kind of sorted them. And your brain is starting to figure them and put them in some kind of distinct areas so that you can separate them and it helps you with your identification and then you can get to your field marks. Uh, here's Fred, a problem that we see. Uh, problem. Fred, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we're hearing a bit of feedback. I think it might be your notes possibly rubbing on your microphone. I don't you're know getting, where your microphone is. Possibly. You're getting, you're getting feedback. Is that what you just said? Yeah, a little bit of that might be notes on your on your microphone was one suggestion. Um, I guess maybe you're rubbing against where your mic is, but just yeah. Okay, I also have someone else downstairs watching this, <laughs> so I, I hope that's not the feedback from there. But if if the if it continues, let me know. I won't put uh, I won't put this on uh, on my computer. The, any notes I have. Uh, okay, here we have a, a female lookalike problem, and uh, I'm going to lower this a bit. And basically what happens with a female lookalike problem, that didn't work. 
if you look at the back end of this bird, uh, I need to, uh, there we go, I can't get the back end of the bird. Oh well, anyways, what you saw here, I'm gonna go back a slide here. You see that hoop over here? That's a, that's a excellent field guide for mallards. And the female lookalike problem is this, that all the females, most females look drab. They, got, they come in these brown hues. And what happens to you is you say, uh, you know, it makes it kind of difficult because they sort of all look the same. And what I want to do is give you a hint, a way of eliminating part of that problem. One of the things you'll do as a new birder, and you'll still do it as an experienced birder, is you'll look at the male because he's easy, he's very distinct, he's splashy. And uh, what he is going to do is, uh, uh, what the male is going to do is he's going to, uh, uh, he's going to pop into your mind and then you're going to look at the woman beside him and you're going to say, well, that's, that's the same species. Well, normally, <clears throat> here's an old saying in, in, uh, in birding that if you, you're looking for a bird and you want something that's rare and different than the mob you're looking at, find something that's different. I'd just like to change that slightly. Instead of looking for something that's different, how about looking for something that's very common? For example, if you went to a pond right now with after the breeding season, et cetera, you, might, you may see over 100 mallards in one pond, over 100 mallards. So uh, a good way to go through it instead of looking for something different is go through looking at something you know. And what you know is a mallard. And what the mallard has is, He's got this, he and she have this white hoop that go around their rear end. And uh, if my head wasn't in the way, and uh, Brian and uh, they're, they're sort of like that. Anyways, this hoop goes right around here. So what I suggest you do, instead of looking for something different, go through the most common bird you can, one that has a field mark that shouts, and, uh, and one that has a field mark that shouts, and the field mark is this white hoop that goes right around the bend, right, right around this bird here. And what you do is you go mallards, you might see four or five at once and say mallards, mallards, mallards. And then when you can't find this hoop, you've got something different. So I, uh, <clears throat> so that, that's a, one way of handling it is, is to look for a white hoop and eliminate the common ones. And when you come across it doesn't have a white hoop, then you know you're in business. You've got somebody else to look at. Um, the northern northern shoveler is the one exception. It took me to, dis to it took me a while to uh, to discover this. I may close down my video. No, I guess I can't. Uh, the northern shoveler is, is an exception to the rule. It too has a white hoop around its tail here. And I'll have to try to move this son, son of a gun again. And you can kind of see it right there. Well, it took me a while to discover that because what I was looking at was the bill. I mean, once you see that bill, the long bill on the shoveler, which he's, a, he's, a, he's in the shallow water. And what he's doing is he's shoveling, shoveling the bottom with it, bottom of the bit so he can, uh, so he's able to get his food that way. So the exception to the rule is the northern shoveler. But knowing about the white hoop that goes around the tail of, of the bird, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good way of, uh, of doing it. Now, here's a quick question. Here's a bird that has a lot of similarities to mallard. It has a very similar head pattern. The bill is almost identical, maybe not in color so much, but almost identical. And look at the tail. Do you see a dominant white hoop around there? There's no white hoop. So you've gone through a mob of birds and you found a bird that hasn't got a white hoop. Now you've got a bird that's different and a bird that looks similar. It looks a bit dark in this picture, but it looks very similar to a mallard, but you know it's now a black duck. It looks like a mallard, but it doesn't have the hoop. And it's, of course, it's, it's a bit darker as well. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing you need to know about, uh, uh, about a concept that you might need to know about is, uh, is speculums. This is a speculum on a bird. This is the back end of the bird. Uh, it's found on the uh, trailing edge of the, uh, of the wing. And uh, what happens with that uh, trailing edge is uh, it's called a speculum. And the field guides make much ado about speculums. But the truth of the matter is 
that the bird tends to hide the speculum and you don't get to see it. So while you're looking at a mallard, trying to identify it by a blue speculum, you won't see it. But the best field guide there, of course, is uh, uh, the best guide there, of course, is uh, uh, is is the is the white hoop. Now here's here's a male white winged scoter. The white winged scoter, as you notice, has got a white wing, and of all the scoters, he's the easiest to identify because he's got this. But if he hides that, and he'll hide that a lot of the times, and I'll show you that in in future photographs to come up, he'll hide that. Then what you're relying on is you're relying on this cue right here, which is kind of a teardrop around this eye here, and that makes him a uh, uh, that makes him a white winged scoter. But without that. He looks very, very close to a black duck, a male black, not a black duck, but rather a uh, male black scoter. And the, uh, and, and, and the male, and the male black scoter is, uh, male black scoter is sometimes, this guy gets misidentified. I've seen him identified at least twice by very excellent birders. And it's because they didn't pick up the eye patch and, this, and he was hiding this uh, speculum here on us. Okay, uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a mallard. And, uh, and remember I talked about the white hoop around the back? This is a good way to pick out a very common bird, the most common bird we have in our area, and eliminating them. Well, see, there's no speculum. Where's that blue speculum that was in your field guide? So anyway, so that's a concept to keep in your mind if you're a beginning birder or if you're not into birding so much. Uh, here's another word that uh, sometimes is, uh, is going to throw a damper on some of your plans or maybe on some of your strategies. Uh, for example, there's this term called eclipse phase. Now, if you look at this mallard over here, or not this mallard, I'm sorry, this uh, red-breasted merganser, you can easily pick out the male. He's very, very distinctive. And you're looking for this male, and, it, and your strategy was identify the male, and then you'll know who these people are. They're the, they're the females. Well, let's just go through this picture over here. Here's the male mallard in a male red-breasted merganser in breeding season. Here is the, uh, this is a juvenile red-breasted merganser. This bird here is, uh, <laughs> this bird, you say, well, it's a juvenile. And of course, he he's, looks like that. You may argue that because that's so he can identify him, uh, so he can be uh, more camouflaged. And here is the, here is the female in her breeding plumage. Of course she looks like a female and of course she looks different than the male below. But look at this picture right here. This is a male. This is a male, this is the guy that you based your whole identity strategy on looking like a female. And what, and that is a necessary part of this bird's survival is to change his feathers twice a year. And when he changes, he changes into this, what is called up here at the title is this word that you may not remember, but the concept you, you should remember uh, is the eclipse phase, is when he that looks like a male now looks like she, but it's not a she, it's a he. So, so, so there you go. So the, and why do birds do this? They do it for a number of reasons. Waterproofing is really important. They, they, they live in water that you wouldn't stick your toe in. You certainly wouldn't go ankle deep in it, it's so cold. So their big defense is feathers. And the feathers have to be fresh and they have to be fluffy. So they change the feathers. Also his hormone level drops off. And because the hormone level has dropped off, because the hormone level has dropped off, this bird's, uh, uh, the bird's not interested in breeding. So when he needs time to breed, uh, this, is, this is what you'll look like. And then you'll, this is where your strategy will come into play. But from what this proves, because he looks like a female, it means that you can't rely on the, him looking like a male all the time. And, and sometimes you'll, when you're birding, if you're a new beginning, you'll be saying, where are all the, where are all of the, uh, where are all the males gone? All we're seeing is females. Well, you're seeing males too, but they're in the, but they're in the eclipse phase. Uh, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the mergansers. And the focus is going to change. I'm going to talk instead about, uh, instead about some of those concepts or you know, how to think as a birder or what's in the mind of the birder and how a birder thinks. I'm going to talk a little bit more about separating birds. And one of the good methods of separating birds 
is sorting together in genus or in species. And for example, these are all mergansers. And if you look at them, we have three in our area. We got the common, the red-breasted, and we have the hooded. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, focus on that a little bit. So we're lumping them in one group and the purpose of lumping them and thinking like a birder, as a, as a rookie birder, you're gonna go to your field guide and you're gonna look for a specific birder, for a, spe for a specific bird. But as a more experienced birder, you're gonna put them in a category and you're gonna say, well, that's a merganser. How do I know it's a merganser? Well, look, they all have this thin bill, thin narrow bill and this thin narrow bill makes them distinct from all of the other birds. In addition to that, they have scalloped edges so that they can grab fish. So their predominant diet is fish. Okay, so um, now I guess if you're, anyway, so, uh, uh, okay, so now we're gonna go on to comparing, uh, comparing uh, uh, the common merganser and the red-breasted merganser. Uh, if you look at this guy, he looks pretty dapper. He looks neat. He's got uh, this nice thing. And this guy over here, he looks like he's, uh, <laughs> he looks like you want to lend him a brush and say, hey, fix yourself up, buddy, so you look a little better. Now, him, uh, he looks, he looks uh, very tidy and neat. And, and here's another trick you can use in birding, if you're an experienced birder, is when you look out at the distance, sometimes you can't see what the birds are. But what you can see is a big splash of white. And uh, there's only two birds that have a big splash of white. And uh, one is a common merganser and the other is a common golden eye. And what you can do with that, knowing that a big splash of white is a common merganser and telling the difference is probably in the length of the bird. For example, this bird has an elongated look. Uh, the common golden eye, which we'll get to later, has a sort of a shorter look to them. And anyway, so, the concept I'm trying to teach you here is overall coloration and birding by impression. The impression is this is kind of a sloppy guy and this guy is, uh, uh, this guy is kind of a neat, neat kind of guy. Now, the next thing I want to deal on is, is uh, separating the females from the males. Now, if you, look at, if you look at this couple over here, the common merganser, just look at them. They look like, look at everything is neat and prim and proper. It's so clean, you know, everything is white and pristine. Look at her. Her hair is combed down. Looks like she just came from the hairdressers. And look at this neckline. It's straight across. Everything is neat and in place. Now look at these sloppy looking guys. This is called birding by impression. He still needs that brush you want to lend him. Uh, she looks uh, a little, probably a little neater than him, but, I'll, uh, but <laughs> she can be disheveled too. So she probably just popped up out of the water. So she looks a little smoother, but she looks a little smoother. And she looks like she needs a you know, to trim her feathers as well and needs a trip to the hairdressers as well. Okay, so here is a question for you. I just told you that that straight cut across line is, uh, uh, would indicate a, a, a common female uh, merganser, a common merganser, uh, but here this bird is not cooperating. The bird has scrunched its head down and you can't tell whether it's a straight line or not. But remember that part about birding by impression? Like, just look at her. She doesn't look neat, she looks sloppy. She looks like someone just poked her in the ribs and said, wake up little Susie. And she looked and said whatever, and what? And how else she looks is, she looks like she hasn't had her morning coffee yet. Anyways, so that's called birding, that's by birding by impression, how you see the bird visually. And, uh, and that's, that's some of the clues. Now here's a, here's a test for you. Uh, what species of merganser is this? So we got, uh, it's, we haven't done hooded, so he's out of the equation. So it's down to red breasted and common. Well, here we go, look at the head. See that, needs the brush, red breasted merganser. Big white side, no, small splash of white. How about her? Well, her hair is starting to look a little disheveled and she doesn't look trim and proper either. Look, the red, the bre goes down here and sometimes the red breasted, it should be red necked, but the red breasted also sometimes comes down over here as well on this side. Anyway, so the answer is, answer uh, to the question is it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a common, uh, it's, it's a red-breasted merganser. Uh, the hooded merganser, on the other hand, uh, he's also in there. And look, he's got the two things. He's got this narrow bill, this fish-like bill that only mergansers have. And he's got that big-headed look, which mergansers tend to have. 
the red breasted, not so much as the common, but they tend to look a bit haggarded. And if you look at the size of the head, it's almost the size of the body. So those are two good clues without getting into a field mark that it's a hooded merganser. Now they can play a trick on you and, and maybe create a problem for you if you're probably a little less experienced. And the problem, uh, the problem they can play with you is that they can fluff this down so it's flat. So they're not so big headed or floofy or puffy looking. And when he folds his down, what it looks like is behind his eye has a thin eye stripe down here. So here's the problem. Here is a uh, female buffle head. She has this white eye stripe that would possibly look very similar to a red breasted merganser, or I'm sorry, a, a hooded merganser. But look at it, look at the bill. So you know it's not, a, it's not that thin fish-like hooky bill. So you're also birding by shape and by impression and that kind of thing. And this has got nothing to do with it. And you don't find this in your field guide sorting this out for you. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna go to, uh, now I'm gonna go to, uh, uh, go to the common golden eye and uh, the title says common golden eye head case. Now here's another very distinctive bird. And if you look at the head, it looks like a triangle. So this trait of looking like a, it goes a steep, a, a sleep, a sleep, a steep slope, slope on front and a steep slope behind. And so we have this, uh, has this triangular kind of look. Now, that is a really good thing to know. And I'll tell you because sometimes a bird is backlit and you can't see that she's a female that has a sort of muddy reddish brown to her. And, and her speculum is now showing, which is, also, which is also a good clue. But sometimes you can't see that. All you see is the shadow or an outline of the bird. But what you can see in that outline is you can see this triangular head. And there is your identification feature. Without even getting into a field mark, you know that, that this is a common golden eye. Now here's the male. Now the male, if you look at it again, he's got that triangular shape, only this time it looks like the... Uh, top has been cut off slightly. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing you notice about the common golden eye, it's got a blob by the eye over here. And remember I was telling you about the, if you're looking off in the distance and you can't really tell and see any features on the bird, but you see these two ducks way out there and they have this big white side. And I said, that, so that narrows it down to two. You've lumped them into two. That's a common merganser you're looking at, or it's a common golden eye you're looking at. But remember the common Merganser has a stretched out look and he has a shorter look. So just by birding by impression, you know it's a common golden eye without seeing a field mark. And, uh, and you can't see the triangle on his head or anything else, but that big blob of white is showing. And that's, uh, and that's one way you can pick up a, a common golden eye and a, and a common merganser at a distance. Uh, I'm only throwing in this Barrow's golden eye. The Barrow's golden eye is a rare bird. It's a, it's a rare bird in that it, uh, it's a rare bird in that it, it nests out in the west coast, uh, in the west coast area. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a sea, a sea bird. Uh, as well as that, it also nests in Quebec and east coast of Quebec. So this guy's probably a stray coming in from Quebec. And the reason I threw this in is that this bird was seen last year and the year before, and he's showing up with a female. So he's showing up and, uh, and uh, he hasn't been reported yet, but how to, how to have seen him would be to be in the Kelso Park looking out and he's, uh, and he's hanging out there. And the difference between him and the common golden eye is the common golden eye has a blob and he has a, sort of a teardrop, a teardrop, you know, and uh, this is a, Teardrops of joy because here's a rare bird you don't get to see and here he is. Okay, so that's my little memory hook. Anyways, the other difference is, of course, the width of the side, you know, the white on the side. He has less side. He has less white, but he has a little bit of white sprinkled up in here. And if you look at the massive white of the common golden eye. Anyway, so I'm throwing that out to you because this bird may be back again. All right, here's a bird landing and uh, it's a common golden eye. And just use your imagination. Let's say that you don't know whether this is a blob or whether it's a teardrop. Teardrop is Barrow's golden eye, uh, blob is common golden eye. And so you're in Owen Sound Harbor and you see this 
And because of the angle of the head, you're not sure whether it's a common golden eye or a barrel's golden eye. Well, what you use is another trick that birders use, and that's common occurrence, like who lives here? The person who lives here is a common golden eye, so you say it's a common golden eye. And you know what? You'll be right almost every, every, every time, except in a rare instance. And uh, there is an expression that experienced birders used, and it's basically this. If it looks like a rare bird that isn't in your area, it probably isn't. So the point is uh, just you know, know what's common in your area and common occurrence, and you can identify knowing that even if you get sometimes a confusing mix of, uh, of field marks. I'm gonna to go to the next thing, uh, next heading here, and this is scop. Now, you may not know anything about birding, but if you listen to this little presentation I'm giving to you, and if you happen to find yourself at Owen Sound Harbor, sitting on the side there with some birder you've never met who's birding and you're birding, and you can talk with us, throw out a little bit of knowledge about this bird that you got from he, me from me today, and he won't know that you can't tell a warbler from a vireo, but he'll think that, wow, this guy knows his bird. So I'm going to give you a, a little insight into this bird. Um, uh, this bird is uh, this bird is a greater scop on, on, on the left and it's a lesser scop on, on the right. These birds are very similar, very similar in looks and in, in uh, I'm just looking for my notes here, but that's okay. They're very similar, they're very similar in looks. However, uh, there's one birder who's around and he says that you cannot tell the difference between a greater scop and a lesser scop. He says you can't do it. And he's an author and he's a fairly prominent birder. Uh, he says, except in one instance, when they raise their wing and you can see the underwing and then you can tell whether it's a greater or lesser. Anyways, there's another outstanding field birder in North America, one of the more out, most outstanding field birders in North America, Ken Kaufman, also an author, and, uh, and he's probably mimicking uh, Peterson in ways. He's trying to be a, 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 you know, he's trying to put out publications with butterflies and trees and other things like that. But anyways, uh, how, so how do you tell the difference about these two very difficult, very similar looking birds? Well, Kaufman would recommend that you use the shape of the head to identify this bird. And he, there's some other recommendations I'll come up a little later. But uh, the interesting thing about this picture is I was looking for a side-by-side -side picture of a, of a greater scop and a lesser scop side-by-side. -side, and I found one uh, on the internet and I contacted Utah Birds and asked permission to use this photo. And they put me on to Brian Curry who gave, us, gave me permission to use this photo. But at the same time, I had to tell him that I wasn't using it for commercial reasons. I wasn't gonna make a million on the photo, but it's, it's just a wonderful photo because it puts a lesser scop right next, right next to the greater scop. Now, let me go over some of the details. They say that a greater scop, but a greater scop is 10% longer than a lesser scop. Well, I can tell you an experience, unless they're sitting on top of each other, that's almost impossible. So that's one of those field, field marks or ideas that you can kind of pitch out. The other thing is that Kaufman says, everything on a greater scop is greater or bigger. So greater and bigger kind of go to head and that's a really good memory hook to learn. Uh, for example, uh, take a look at the width from the front of the bill to over here. That's a lesser scop and compare it with the front to the back over here. This is a greater scop, everything is greater. Look at the bill length from here to here. Look at the bill length here. Hard to pick up though, you know, so you can see this, you can see this argument that, uh, you know, you can't tell the difference between a greater and lesser scop, but look at it, it is, it is a bit larger. And then there's something called a nail and a nail is, uh, is a little hook at the end and I'll deal with that in the, in the next slide. Uh, this slide here is, uh, this slide here has got, uh, three things on it. It's got a bill, a nail, and a jowl, and it shows you the difference side by side. And looking at the greater scop, we already established from the previous picture that it's longer. And if you look at the lesser scop, you've established from the picture there that this is, that it's, it's, it's uh, narrower. Now the nail, which is that little hook thing there, I've, I've never been able to use this field mark ever. 
but it's, it's kind of at this black tip here and it's got a slight tip here that points downward, not like a raptor, the tip of a raptor, but, but smaller. And it's not as wide, see, it's smaller as well. So those are a number of, number of things that uh, will, uh, will identify, you know, separate a greater scop from a lesser scop. Are they hard to do? Yes, they are to do. But I'll tell you, see the jowls on this? He looks like a chipmunk that you've been feeding there. You're trying to have your morning coffee. Who keeps pestering you for more peanuts? And he empties your bag of peanuts. And uh, meanwhile, he keeps looking like that and running away. And so that I've picked up and I've seen that. And that's, that's seeable and discernible in, in the field if you, you know, with a good view. And look at him. He looks like he doesn't have, a, doesn't have uh, jaws and they're quite narrow. And look at his eyes. He kind of looks mad like saying to you, like the chipmunk, like where are the peanuts, buddy? But there are no peanuts for him. It just seems that, so everything is bigger on a scop. Um, all right, next. Uh, here's uh, the wing pattern that the author said that you can't tell the difference between a greater scop and a lesser scop, said that the one point where you could tell the difference. Here on the greater scop, you can see that everything is greater on a greater scop. And look at this wing stripe. It goes right from, right from the tip, right to the armpit. And look at the lesser scop. It goes from, from about the armpit to the, to the uh, wrist. And from that point on, it's brown. So the old adage, everything is greater on a greater scop is, uh, is, is, uh, is true. Nope. I'm, okay, here we go. All right. Now I just saw something here. Maybe I can, uh, I can I'm gonna hide myself view. Maybe that'll give us more room. Oh, no, I guess not. I still got a few other people here. Maybe they could, uh, maybe they could turn their video off too, and then we'd have a full screen. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we're going to deal with the uh, we're going to deal with the uh, female scops, uh, the female scops, and it's also a question of bigger. Oh boy. Okay, Brian, Robin. I don't know if you're on my screen or not, but I'm getting I'm getting you three at the bottom of my screen here. It's always a quest question of bigger as well. Hey, uh, hey, sorry, Fred, to interrupt. Yeah, it, it is adjustable to everyone watching. So on the yeah. top of the, like where the video is, they can minimize the video if they want, and you can as well. So okay, if, how, do I minimize, how do I minimize your video? I guess, I'll, okay, let me try this. Hide non-video participants. There we go. All right, I'm back to me. <laughs> so I'm the problem. Okay, uh, idea, it's the same thing. What Kaufman said, everything is bigger on a, look at, look at the head width, bigger. Bigger. Look at the look at the look at the width of the uh, of the bill. Larger, larger. Look at the nail. It's bigger. Can barely see it here. And you can apply the same principles to the female. Bigger, uh, bigger. The the thing is bigger. Everything is bigger. Size is bigger, etc. And I used the male. Sorry for that. But anyway, so bigger is the thing with uh, separating the idea of these two birds. Okay. Here is. Uh, here, is, uh, here are two birds. Uh, they are obviously, take a look at this. Remember that old tip we gave you about the most common bird in our area? There it is, there's the hoop. There's the back bumper, there it is. So that is obviously a mallard. Now in my very, very early beginning days of birding, I would sometimes see a bird like this and I'd see a bird beside it that looked almost the same, like it looks almost identical. And I would assume that this was a baby of, you know, a, a, a mallard that hadn't quite grown up to full size yet. Well, that was a wrong assumption. Size is also an important part. You know, when I, I told you to look for, look for the bumpers, you know, you might see these birds three or four at a time and just keep going through them until you find one that's different. Well, this one here is different. The, the photograph may be not as clear as it could be right here, but uh, there, the tail is over here. And this is on sort of a side view at the back part. And, and this bird here is 23 inches long, and this bird here is only about 14 inches long. Now, what, what I would do with, uh, uh, what you're doing now is you're, you're, you're looking for size. And if you want to know what a teal is, you've got two things you've learned here. First of all, it's in shallow water. So it's a, it's a dabbler. Teal are dabblers. There are two teals. There's blue wing and green wing. And the problem is separating green wing from blue wing. Okay, but now you've got, you've, you've got this female, you've got another dabbler, and it's, you know it's a teal, you have to determine which one it is, 
and that totally eliminates the small size divers, uh, you know, and the small size divers could be like ruddy duck and it, uh, and it could be buffle head. So they're out of the picture. They're not even a question. So size is important and it's really important in identifying teal. So you're looking, you're going through your hoop bit trick, you know he's about 23 feet, 23 inches long, and then you come across him. And you know you got yourself a teal, because why? Because he's a dabbler, and he's smaller, and he's, and what does a, what does an immature, a young growing uh, mallard look like? Well, guess what? He's got a hoop on the butt. So this guy is, so this is a teal. And it's the question of size that brought you to that answer. So thinking like a birder further, uh, take a look at these, green, uh, these two green wing teals. This male, which we probably learned in our early days because it was distinctive, as opposed to this lady all dressed in brown here that is not distinctive. Uh, uh, take a look at him. He's got this brown uh, part over here sticking out, part of his feather sticking out here. And uh, this could appear buff colored as it is in the photo. Sometimes it appears white as it is in this photo over here. And how you tell a green wing tail is two ways. Uh, uh, first of all, it's size. It's smaller than a mallard, a lot smaller than a mallard. And then the second thing you look for is, what is this on the butt over here? See that thing? That's the marker. That's the male version. This is the film version. So the size plus this tells you it's a green wing tail and you just identified a fairly hard bird to identify. Now, let's get on to the blue winged teal. This is a beautiful bird. If you can see it in real life, it's got blue here. Its uh, blue wing is being hidden right now. Uh, remember, we talked about hidden speculums, but right now we know about that, so we're not going to worry about the speculums. Uh, if you look at this, he's got a crescent head, and that's very nice. What does she have? Well, her spectrum is, is, is hiding as well. The, her blue spectrum is hiding as well. But what she has is, she has this white version of this. It's not much a version, it's a smudge. He's got the crescent, she's got the smudge. And you know that's a blue winged tail. So here we come, here's a big test for you right off the bat. Which one is the blue winged tail and which one is the green winged tail? And of course, the answer you just saw her. Remember the lady with the smudge, little smudge there? And how do you know it's a teal? Because she's small. She's only 15 inches long compared to the 14 inches of a mallard. She's a small duck and she's a dabbler. That's the other thing you learn. She's in the, she's in the shallow water. So there's two tips of those concepts I gave you earlier that are now coming into play with identifying this bird. And look at him and look at this guy here. And this is obviously, see that little mark? That's, that's, uh, that's a green wing teal. So, uh, and, and how do we know it's a green wing teal? Because green wing teals are dabblers and dabblers are in shallow water and you can see that. And, and there you go. So you're using the earlier things that we talked about earlier and you're applying them to the current things you're looking now, perhaps on my slide and perhaps in the water. Okay, next is, uh, next, uh, next are the scoters. And uh, <laughs> the scoters are trouble. And if you're new to birding, I don't want to bog you down with detail because detail is just going to kind of, uh, kind of lose you on, on this. So I'm going to try to keep this very simple, but I'm going to throw out something here that maybe for the more experienced birders or the lesser experienced birders might want, want to learn or know. But what we have with scoters is there's three ducks. Remember I talked about lumping them or sorting them? We got three ducks. We got the surf scoter. We have a white wing scoter who happily is showing us white wing here and sort of over here. And then we have the black scoter and we have the female black scoter. Okay, okay, and moving on to the next one. Let's look at the white wing scoters here. Gotta move me. Uh, that's good. These are white wing scoters, and, and look, at, look at them. The white wings are hidden. There's a, there's a white wing, there's a white wing, but you know, where is it on this white wing scoter? Not there, not there, and not on her. The male, and how do we tell it's a male white wing scoter from the black wing scoter by the bill a little bit, and probably by this eye drop. That makes him a white wing scoter. Now look at this one over here. We've got the female down here. And look at her, she's got a white blob in front of her eye over here. But, uh oh, we got a problem here. 
Here's a scoter that's got two blobs. Now that is a juvenile white wing scoter. And how do we know? Well, blob one, blob two. Growing up now, you only get one blob. Okay, moving on. Now we come to a very gorgeous bird. If you see this male surf scoter in the sunlight, uh, it'll just dazzle you and put a smile on your face. He's got this bright white on black, white on the forehead, orange on the bill and white here. And he just seems to glow and it's just the beauty just kind of is, is, is moving. But then we look at the female. Oh, oh, we have a problem here. We got, we have a uh, two dot scoter and there's a two dot scoter. This is a juvenile. And here she is, a female scoter with two dots. So what are we as birders going to do? How are you going to solve this dilemma? And the dilemma is like this. Well, here's, here's the immature white wing scoter with his two dots. And here's the female sur scoter with her two dots and with some sort of crustacean in her mouth. Uh, he's showing his, uh, the white wing scoter showing his uh, speculum here, so that's good. So how are we going to tell the difference between the two? Well, the difference is in the nature of it. This guy is a truly a two blob scoter. He's got a blob here and he's got a blob there. The female surf scoter has a blob behind her eye, but her blob is a vertical stripe. And it's not really a blob, it's almost, almost rectangular. So that is for, that's one of the finer points that maybe the more experienced birders would probably appreciate and probably most of you, and, the, and, and of course some of you probably already know. So, in separating a female surf scoter for an immature white wing scoter, uh, look for the blobs or look, look for the rectangle, which is in front of the, you know, this vertical stripe. So it comes down to a question of blobs and a question of vertical stripes for a female surf scoter. Ah, uh, the black scoter. The black scoter is, uh, uh, it looks all black and he could be confused for a, could be confused for a white wing scoter because they hide their speculums too, but he doesn't have that white, white drop around his eyes. So that makes him a black male scoter. The female scoter has got this white on the patch and usually it expresses itself when you're looking at is you're seeing dark from here down. And when it looks like that, she looks remarkably close to a black duck. And how do you distinguish between a black duck and how do you distinguish between a female black scoter? Well, the answer goes back to the beginning. She's a diver. She's in the deep water. The black duck, he's a dabbler. He's hugging, he's hugging the shoreline. He's, he wants to put, put the bum up in the air and, and dabble on the bottom. And she's going to dive for crustaceans and mollusks and stuff like that. And that's her lifestyle and that's how she makes a living. Okay, here's a quickie test. What is this bird? Oh, oh it's got white on the side here. I haven't told you about the water, but I'll confess this is deep water. So what is this? Well, the similar looking bird is a black duck. And this other similar looking bird is of course a female black duck. Well, I'm sorry, a female black scoter. This is, this is the female black scoter because the water is deep. Remember, dabblers and divers, she is a diver. So going back to the beginning of things that, don't, that the field guide may not tell you. All right, here's a quickie test. What bird is this flying low over the water? And what scoter is this? And he's uh, showing, well, well, there, there you go. The easiest scoter of all identify, a white wing scoter. I was uh, probably close to 30 years ago, I was down by Cape May and I was at a, at a sea watch. A sea watch is sort of like a hawk watch, except they, uh, they sit by, uh, they sit on the seashore and they count the sea ducks flying by as they're migrating south. And then there was a very experienced birder running it and he said, well, there's a flock of scoters, spuh, he said. When a birder says spuh, that means he knows it's a scoter, but he doesn't know whether it's one of the three scoters. He can't buy, he, there's nothing he can pick up on it. And me being, you know, a little bit, you know, you know, not going to the ocean too often said to him, how do you know it's a black scoter? Like, and you didn't see anything on it. Like, how could you tell that's a black scoter? And he sort of said, you know, let me think about that for a while. So the, the, the idea that it was a black scoter was so inborn into him that, uh, and then after he said, oh, I know what it is. He says, first of all, he said, they fly low over the water. 
and uh, and they usually go in groups. And so, and that was that was going back to you know going back to birding by impression. Flies low over the water. It's dark in color. It's black in water. It's flying by in groups. It's heading south. It must be a scoter. So he identified identified it as a scoter spa, which means scoter species. Okay, we're on the last little bit here, and uh, I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of into a whole bunch of birds and how to identify them. I'm just trying to deal more with the concepts of what a what an experienced bird receives and how an experienced birder. Uh, uh, and how an experienced birder looks at birds. I'm gonna, we're gonna identify swans. We have three swans species in our area. We have a mute swan. We have a, which is pictured here obviously, and we have a, uh, uh, we have a tundra swan and we have a trumpeter swan. Now looking at this, uh, looking at this photo, this is, this is a mute swan and it's the easiest because it has a behavioral pattern where it likes to curve its neck. And as it curves its neck, it gives it kind of a majestic look to it. And then it's, and then it's got this uh, black knob here and this orange bill, and it's a beautiful looking bird. This is an introduced bird from Europe. And uh, this was brought over by someone who's wanted to get all the birds of Shakespeare in North America and brought this bird, which is kind of an aggressive swan and, uh, and is not bad at kicking out other smaller birds out of its habitat. But, uh, Anyway, so this is the easy one, and you can, and now this concept, this business of curving your neck, that's a behavioral thing, and it's uh, behavior is sort of like you. You've got your, uh, uh, your, you're out exploring on the roads. You don't nearly, you don't often go down this old dirt road. You've never been there, so you go there, and you're not found there ever, and you tend not to do that, and you go down there, and uh, <laughs> after doing it once, you say to yourself, I'm not going down that road again. That's just too rough and too hard on the car. Anyway, so this behavior is like that. We have behaviors that are predictable, but sometimes our behavior is unpredictable. And this one's going to keep coming up with the photos I'm going to show you to keep telling me I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, this is just to show you uh, an adult mute swan with a young. This is a young, and she's straightening up. The, the bird's got its uh, neck straightened up there. And here's the mute swan trying to put a curve in it, but not quite. So what I just told you on the previous one, I still say holds true, but not in the photos I'm going to show you. All right, these are tundra swans. Now, what's distinct about a tundra swan? Well, it looks pretty darn close to what a trumpeter swan looks like, and they're very hard to tell apart. Now, there's a field mark you can use, and the field mark is it's got yellow right at the thing here, and a trumpeter swan doesn't have that. And you can see it here and here, but it's not here, and it's not here, and not visible here, and definitely not visible here. So it's a iffy field mark. See it sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't show up. Uh, the other, now getting away from field marks and getting to the other birding by impression, or what's in the mind of a birder. What's in the mind of a birder is a tundra swan is a migratory bird. And you'll see a tundra swan in October uh, when, he's going, when they're going south. And you'll see them in March when they're going north to the tundra. And, uh, and so that's a, uh, oh, I forgot one field mark. I'll get back to it in a second. So that's, that's one thing you would use. The other thing that you, you'd use is these swans as they're migrating will sometimes land in fields. Trumpeter swans, trumpeter swans and mute swans tend to stay out of fields. So you got two birding by impression concepts here. Look for them in March, look, look for them in October. Uh, and the other one is if you find them in the field, you've eliminated the other two from your mind, you sorted the swans as a group, you've eliminated those two because that's not where they go. But that's a behavioral trait. And we know that sometimes behaviors, behaviors uh, will change. Uh, here's, a, here's something that the birding club used to go to once a year. We, we, we're gonna miss it this year because of COVID. But every, uh, every spring in March, we'd go down to see what we, we called a spectacle. And it was the tundra swan spectacle, where thousands of tundra swans would show up, just in Grand Bend uh, on Greenway Road, uh, just off Grand Bend in this field here, and there'd be thousands of them. Uh, you know, like, like thousands, literally thousands of them. And we'd go down there and sit there and enjoy, enjoy the spectacle and, uh, and enjoy, their, uh, enjoy the view. And, uh, I think, believe the Owen Sound Field Naturalist ran his hike once where they took a bus down 
and uh, got lucky, got the right week, and got the uh, and got to, got this found the spectacle, and that was a hike, led, a hike led by Peter Middleton, and that was maybe I don't know seven eight years back. I don't know. Anyways, the trumpeter swans, the trumpeter swans have a very distinctive <laughs> field mark. And if you see a swan with this on it, it's a trumpeter swan. The trumpeter swans were nearly extinct. They were nearly extinct for a reason is that uh, they were, you know, a big sight and they, and easy to shoot. They were shot for food. Uh, they were shot for their skin. Women at the time were using the skin of trumpeter swans to put their, uh, you know, as, as put them in their compacts to put makeup on their faces, you know, and, and so, that was a couple of reasons, and their feathers. They had beautiful long feathers, so they made a fine writing quill. So we almost wiped them out. But back in Hamilton, there's a, a, a gentleman called uh, Harry Lumsden. Whoops. Oh, sorry. A gentleman called Harry Lumsden, who about 1986 decided that he was going to try to reintroduce them. So he bored about, I think, about 50 eggs. No, he bored some eggs and. Uh, started uh, started uh, doing this in what's called Burlington Bay or Hamilton Harbor, depending whether you live in Hamilton or whether you live in Burlington. Uh, so in Burlington Bay, he started this and uh, he started to hatch them. He uh, wintered them, protected them over winter. And these swans, these trumpeter swans are now growing and it's very common to see trumpeter swans that don't have this brilliant name tag, you know, that brilliant field mark, which I call it in this case. That is a trumpeter swan. And of course that was taken on. And here it is, uh, I think, er, uh, he started this when he was re in retirement, I believe. And, and I think he's, believe he's still alive. And if he is still alive, he'd probably be, he was alive last year. He should be about age 96 right now. And of course this, uh, this work was uh, uh, taken over by, uh, by a, a le lady, lady called Bev Kingdom. Her family took in those early trumpeter swans to overwinter them. And, uh, and she's remained uh, main, main part of it while, uh, while Mr. Lumsden is now retired from the scene. I, I believe that Bev Kingdom has sort of taken over it. Anyways, what's the field mark here? The field mark on a trumpeter swan is it's got a point. You see that point? That makes it a trumpeter swan. Going back to the, uh, I'd have to go back two slides. Going back to the tundra swan, uh, Looking at that, look at that, that's a U. It has a U, it doesn't have a point. See, that's a U. Of course, these are difficult to see. Uh, these are difficult to see uh, field marks because uh, they're difficult to see field marks because they're, uh, uh, you know, for a number of reasons, you know, because, uh, because the bird is not looking at you in this case, and you know, sort of like this case. And it's, and it, they're also a small field mark that might be hard to pick up. All right, I'm gonna give you a quickie quiz. Here are two birds in this picture. What are their species? Well, this guy, well, he's the easy one. He's not, well, he's sorta of got his neck curled, but he's got a black knob, he's got, he's got an orange bill, and of course he's the mute swan. But what about this guy? Well, you don't know the month, so you don't know if it's October or March. You don't know, what it's not in a field, it's in a wetland, so that puts a trumpeter swan into play as well. But what field mark does he show? He's got a U over here. And the U makes him a, makes him a tundra swan. So he's a tundra swan. Here's one here, and this is a, another swan. I don't know what month it is. Uh, I think that's water behind with leaves in it. Uh, so it might be October, it might not be October. And so he's giving you a full on headshot. And what do you see there? You see a straight line here and a straight line there, no curve there. It's a point. So it is a, it is a trumpeter swan. Now what's this? Is this a U or a point? Well, it kind of curves around. So I'm calling that a U and I'm calling it a tundra swan. All right, I'm just summing up here. I just want to kind of review what we've done. Uh, we've talked about uh, diving versus dabbling ducks and we showed how divers are in the deep water and you can categorize them and put them in a, a grouping by themselves. And the dabbling ducks are mostly uh, vegetarians and they're in the shallow water and you can put them in a group of ducks and that was particularly 
insightful and particularly helpful when it comes to finding a small bird called a teal in the shallow water. Uh, then we talked about the female duck problem and how, uh, and how it leads to a false strategy. We're just going to rely on what the male looks like. And the problem with the females is they tend to look like, uh, uh, they all tend to look brown and come in the same hues and they all look the same. And the big clue I gave you was instead of looking for a different bird, look for the bird that's most common. And I gave you the white hoop idea. Look for the white hoop and help partially solve this problem. And then when you don't see a white hoop, then you're now into identifying the bird. And if it fits in the dabbling duck category, then you're down to about four or five species of birds. It fits in the diving duck category, then you're in the, in, into uh, a number of species that are in a different category. And then we talked about speculums, which are big in field marks, but in the actual field come into small play. But they're still important and still good to know. We talked about shape being important in a bird and just think about the triangular head of a common golden eye. And that's one example. Think of that big bulbous head of the uh, hooded merganser where the head is almost as big as the body. And we also talked about time of the year. And that's a particularly important with migratory birds. And uh, in terms of tundra swans, we gave you two dates. They migrate in October and they migrate in March. And, uh, and, uh, and anyway, so time of the year is important. You know, so. And also what's important to that is knowing whether it's a migratory duck or whether it's a, whether it stays here. Now the, uh, the tundra swan and, and the mute swan are introduced species. And to learn to migrate, you have to, uh, <laughs> you have to be taught that. Well, they hadn't been taught that. So they did a heck of a lot of suffering getting through our, through our winters for a while. And in the suffering, they learned, you know, as their, as their, as their pond froze up that they had to move and if and if luck was on their side they went south and so they're in the throes of learning to partially migrate going where there's open water okay uh playing the percentages uh playing percentages i gave that example on you know was that a teardrop or was that a or was that a kind of a blotch on the side of a common golden eye and because the common golden eye is in our area the percentage we're playing is that it is a common golden eye. And you know what? Those are better odds of you being right than the casino has over you when you go gambling there. So you have a really good percentage of being right there. And then of course, then there's the behavior, you know, and using the, the last one lately is uh, the tundra swans tend to be in fields, but not so for the mute swans and the, uh, not so for the mute swans and, and, and the uh, uh, trumpeter swans. The other part with behavior is, or dealing with behavior, it could be other things. Say like, I'm a dabber and that's my behavior and I'm a, a, a diving duck. If I'm a dabber, does that mean I never go into deep water? Well, once in the blue moon, you'll go into deep water. If I'm a dabber, that means I can't dive. Well, in all my years of birding, I've only seen a mallard dive once and I was elated. I thought that's great. And then of course, there's the overall coloration. Remember that trick about uh, the big broad white side of a, a common merganser that can be seen at a distance even though you can't tell if it's a merganser and the big uh, broad white side of the uh, common golden eye and then and going back to shape and size again that the merganser had a longer look and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, <laughs> and the common golden eye had a had a shorter look and then just and we threw in the odd field mark uh, because we had to and uh, and, as, and, and field marks are important. I don't want to say that field marks, I don't want to be standing derogatory about field marks because if you ever do find a rare bird, they're not going to go with this stuff because this stuff is speculation. This stuff is your opinion. This is stuff that's not solid. What's solid is a field mark. And field marks are hard to, re, hard to, hard to refute. Time of year, they could tell you, well, yeah, that, yeah you got called that a, a trumpeter swan or a ton, but it's not a trump. No, it, you call that a, a tundra swan, but it's not a tundra swan because you got the time of year wrong. Or birds don't migrate as scheduled. And it's that behavioral problem. They might migrate a little earlier, or a little later, that kind of thing. Anyway, so field marks are important. And uh, so keep, keep cranking at your field marks. But if you really want to get to be a good birder, you can apply all of this behavior, this uh, habits, uh, the size, the shape, and what's not, I hadn't mentioned here at all, is habitat. 
probably the two most important things in birding before you ever look at a field mark, and more important in field marks, is the shape of the bird, think great blue heron, and the size of the bird, you know, think about a hummingbird. You know, so those things give you, a, those things are good things that lead you down the path. So these, if you want, I think if you want to become a more experienced birder, you have to, you have to do this. And, you know, I learned from my, I pass on ideas to my, uh, my friends in the, in the birding club and they pass on ideas to me. Uh, once in a while, I, I go on a spree of wanting to learn about a section of birding and I get into that so I can learn from books. But anyways, Looking into the mind, birder requires experience and experience comes, but you have experience right now. Like you can tell it's a robin. You can tell it's a robin by the time of the year. You can, even though you don't see its red breast, you might see an outline, it's, it's a wreck stance and you know it's a robin. So you're doing it already. And can you do this? Yes, you can do it. Will this make you a birder? This will make you a great birder. And this of course, you need this to prove your case. So you need field marks to prove your case. Anyways, uh, if you wish to contact me, uh, my email is, uh, is, is, is below. If you have any questions or anything, you wish to contact me once it's over. Now, I think, Stu, uh, you're going to pass me on some questions, are you not? Yeah, first of all, a couple of things. I'd like to really thank you, Fred, for this. Uh, Nancy and I have been enjoying this presentation today and uh, picked up a number of new ideas to us. So we really do appreciate that. And... Uh, there's 53, it was up to, fit, up to fit. Uh, machines uh, attached to us, and so probably more people than that. And uh, we're going to take some questions here. And I'd also like to thank the Brian Robin. And Brian was great, and uh, we used uh, um, the Owen Sound Field Naturalist Zoom account to do this today, and he, and he took care of the technical stuff in the background. So I'm not going to put up my video here. I'll just take, I just have a few questions that I that have been posted already. If you have questions, you can post them in the Q&A area down the lower right. And uh, we'll take a few questions here now. And it's also possible to put your hand up. I'll try to scroll up and down. If I see a hand up uh, um, from, from one of the participants also. The first question I have is that from John who said that he's heard that wood ducks whistle. Do they also have a quack, Fred? <laughs> now you got me on that one, John. So yeah, they, they do whistle and uh, do they quack? I've never heard a wood duck quack, but you know, I've been, I'm, I'm my third set of hearing aids and uh, hearing isn't my big forte. That's what I use Marilyn for. She, uh, she clues me in on, on those kind of things. I would say go with a whistle, John. <clears throat> That's great. Leslie Wood uh, asked a question here and he said, the tails look different between a greater and lesser squat, lesser scop when the tail is up. Is that a correct observation? Uh, no, it's probably not, not a, uh, a great observation because uh, other birds, they can all put their tails up and some do. And, and the one that we associate with the tail up the most is a ruddy duck. So tails up, uh, uh, you know, tail propped up is, uh, is it can apply to all birds. They all have that ability to do that. So I, I what guess Leslie was saying that I hear that she saw a difference between the greater and lesser squat when their tails are up. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know, Leslie, you, you're ahead of me there. I, I, I've i never picked that up. So maybe that's something next time I go birding for scop, I'll, I'll, I'll look for the tails and see if uh, the tail up is, uh, is, will provide the answer to that as well. Okay. Uh, from, uh, Lambert is asking, uh, can, um, what are your favorite spots here oh, in Bruce County to be birding? Well, I belong to a birding especially club. For water, especially for waterfowl here, Fred. Oh, for waterfowl. Well, you know, there's uh, the, uh, here, the uh, Owen Sound Field Naturalist has for years uh, been offering a uh, around the bay waterfowl hike. And I, I, I spent about 12 years of those doing that. And uh, so the, the bay is a good area. And November is a good time. Uh, the naturalists are still doing this with a small, small number of group. They're, they're experimenting with uh, taking a group out. And I've been replaced with two really excellent field, oh, my heart just moves when I think about them, two really excellent field birders and, you know, Kaya Jasper and Eric Van Den Kaboom, uh, Van Den Kaboom and uh, they're, they are jointly leading that hike and uh, they've got eyes and they got ears and maybe we'll answer that whistling duck prop question for you. 
That's great. Any, any place in Bruce County you can mention? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Going a little on. Well, there's a number of places uh, that, you know, I, I live in Southampton. So one of, uh, one of the key places for waterfowl, of course, would be the waterfront down here with, uh, they call it Miramichi Bay. That's the road that, uh, Miramichi Bay Road, that's the road that uh, borders the lake. Uh, as you leave uh, Southampton, go to Port Elgin or vice versa, and you get good views of the lake there. And there's, there's one called uh, uh, Horseshoe Bay and, uh, uh, and you know, and there's, so there's two bays there. So you can look for birds in there and you can also look out in the deeper water as well and maybe pick up the odd scoter there as well. The other good place for waterfowl, uh, that one of the first places that comes to mind that uh, uh, we all use, and that's called the Independent Pond. There's in Port Elgin, there's a uh, independent store and behind it is, uh, is the area where they drain the water from the parking lot into a pond. And we call that the Independent Pond. And uh, we've seen we've seen some uh, great uh, great birds in there. Uh, I think uh, someone, yeah, I think Bev uh, Carlisle saw a barnacle goose in the area, and uh, and so it it picks up some rarities sometimes. Right now, you could probably go there, and you could probably pick up American wigeon, and of course there'd be a, a ton of mallards. There would be, a, and of course, Canada geese would be there, and of course you might get the odd other other bird as well. And it's kind of a hit and miss thing, eh? And there's another place called Chalmers Pond, and Chalmers is probably getting a little far away from Owen Sound. Uh, if you go down Highway 21, and you go uh, and uh, you go uh, and just before you get to uh, King Carden, there is the Seventh Concession. If you turn left on the Seventh Concession, and uh, you turn left on the Seventh Concession, this is Highway 21, of course, borders the lake sort of there. And turn left and go up the road there and you'll see this uh, community church there uh, and uh, this if you turn left at that road I'm not sure of the concession number it could be five no no it's not five I, it could be side road five or or ten but but the key 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 thing for me is is the church there just on the other side of the road turn left there and you don't have to go too far down the road maybe a hundred feet or two hundred feet or so and you'll come up a hill and you'll see a pond this pond too has seen some great, wonderful waterfall come through it. And uh, you name a, name a, you know, finding a good bird around here and between the Independent Pond and Chalmers Pond on the right day at the right time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And with a little bit of luck, you might, you might get some really good birds there. So those are uh, three places uh, or four places I think I've recommended there. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Uh, we have a question from Sue, a good question from Sue who's asking the difference between a goose and a duck is the only size that you look for? Well, I think size is one, and I think it's also a question of, uh, of, it, uh, of, of genus as well. So it's in a different genus as well. And, uh, and, and the biggest difference is size. Uh, some geese are, is, are fairly small, like there's a Canada goose uh, that looks like a Canada goose called a cackling goose. And it's just a, a little bigger than, than, a, than a waterfowl. And uh, other than being in a different genus, and I think they're all in the family uh, of avians, so they fit there, but being a, they're in a different genus and a different uh, subgroup of, uh, of avian family, the avian family of birds. Uh, and size is probably a good one with a few minor exceptions. And we had uh, some, some snow geese just seen just recently in Independent Pond, so it's just kind of Something to keep your eyes open for in the area too, right now as it could be coming through. Would you just repeat that bird again, Stu? Oh, did we have snow geese in Independent Pond? Yes, we did have uh, snow geese in the Independent Pond, and uh, I think we've uh, we've seen some there. And uh, you know, but they're they're traveling, so you know, it's you're hitting it at the right time. And uh, they've also been seen in other places in Bruce County as well. And uh, uh, they could be seen in in the harbor at uh, at uh, down by, uh, you know, down by Owen Sound there, right there, or, or a little farther out as well. So yeah, snow geese are coming through and this is a good time, uh, good time to find them. Uh, also, the other thing that's happening right now with waterfowl is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, sandhill cranes are accumulating too. So they're gonna be taken off uh, probably by November. So you only got maybe a couple of weeks to, to go look for them. but. You might get lucky just traveling the back roads, but Bruce County Road 70, for example, and uh, some of the side roads off, or Gray County Road 70, uh, taking some of the side roads off there, and you might come across a large flock of, uh, 
of sandhill cranes. Uh, we, uh, our birding club saw a very, very large flock of them once uh, driving between uh, Hepworth and, uh, and Highway 21, towards Highway 21, and uh, they're on the right-hand side. So, so they're around. You just you have to go out there and, uh, and, and look for them and find them. Great. Now, I don't see any, any hands up at this point, and that was the last question in the Q&A area. So, Fred, thank you again for today, and thank you to the participants for coming in. We think we're at uh, 57 in total right now, 45 right now. So, and we'll maybe be doing this again in the near future or with a different topic, and, and we'll keep you informed. And okay. thank you again, Brian, for your help with this. Hey, Stu, thank you for moderating. Thank you very much. That was important, too. Okay, everybody. Uh, well, uh, we'll 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 keep we'll keep you informed with anything coming up in the future. Bye for now. Bye bye.